All right, thanks, Michael, for those uh, kind words. Uh, I put my name up here on the slide as well. Sometimes I find in the US people think I typed in my password in the wrong field or something, but this is my name. <laughs> The one thing that's not on the slide is Kayak, because I left them uh, two weeks ago to pursue some private passion projects. Uh, but indeed, the last 10 years I've been in the Booking group. Uh, six, weeks, six years at Booking, two years at OpenTable, and then one year at Kayak, doing optimization as a senior director of product management and various other roles at Booking, running a lot of teams there, sort of creating an experiment culture and participating in building this culture we had in those teams. And that's what I want to talk to you about today with this humbly named talk, Building a $100 billion Culture. And that is not the largest number my daughter can think of. It is the market valuation of the booking group. So for those of you who are not familiar with it, it is what used to be called the price, Priceline Group. But we changed the name in February to reflect that Booking.com is the biggest and most impactful part of the, uh, of the business. And the Booking is also, I think, probably one of the largest experimentation institutions in the world. Uh, the last number that they shared publicly about concurrent experiments running was about 1,000. It's substantially more now, I can tell you. And the other companies in the group as well also have a really steady pace of experiments. OpenTable uh, peaked at about 200 experiments, but we're really we're running fast. Kayak is doing a lot, and then we have Agoda, rental cars, and so on, who's really heads down experimenting uh, a lot. The, uh, what I want to talk about is sort of just some personal reflections, some experiences I made during those years, and in the end, I have a slide with a bit more rigorous uh, references that you can look at for people who have done like, more academic research and sort of how to do, build organizations and so on. Uh, but I have five things I want to talk about. The first thing is really the essentials. Don't assume people get it. Experimentation um, and A-B testing has a lot of very there's not a lot of standardization of the terms we are using. And a lot of the terms we are using are really overloaded by other sort of like people use those terms like experiment in a lot of ways that's not really specific. And when you have a large organization where you grow and add in like 100 people per month and things like that, you want to make sure you're really explicit in the terms you're using and you want to make sure everyone is trained. And I just want to pull out some examples. Uh, of things I have seen people not get. Um, and there's nothing that's wrong with this. Like things like randomization, statistical significance, type one and two errors, that's not intuitive. Like you need to be trained on that. People need to be trained to get that. Conversion rate is a funny one because I think everyone here in the room knows what conversion rate is. But if I ask you how to calculate it, you'll probably come with a lot of different explanations or different definitions. So I've seen people that do just transactions divided by sessions. Uh, I've seen other companies where people do uh, unique bookers divided by unique visitors and things like that. And that really matters. It matters for what sort of statistical methods you use and things like that. And as an organization, you really need to get together, figure out what those terms mean, and then standardize on that. Uh, control versus treatment is funny. Not everyone gets that because they have, might have used terms like experiment to just mean doing something new. Um, control, uh, Vinsa kept lots of stopped. This is the only one on this list I kind of find a bit unforgivable, but I can't understand it after all. But the first time I came across this was um, I was talking with a director at Booking.com, very smart guy, but very much outside the conversion optimization part of the business, who had learned that we had about as many losses or as many losing experiments as we had winning experiments. And it was like, aha, I caught you with your pants down. Why are we spending time on it then? And it's like, dude, those losing experiments are shut down after two weeks. The winning experiments we are running forever. So the impact is much larger. And I do realize that for some people, if you're coming from a campaign background, you don't necessarily switch into that mindset. And 
in some organizations, you run experiments to just learn, and then you take it back to the lab, and then use that as an insight to build something else. So you never know where people are coming from, so even, some things, even things that seem essential or basic, you need to train people on. Uh, learning is valuable. Sometimes engineers are really unhappy with throwing out code that you build just to learn something. Opportunity cost is not only about button colors, a lot of other things like that. So I would recommend to sort of create a structured curriculum, define all the terms you are using, track who's trained, train the new guys, train the old hands, and even when you hire these like really top guys that are doing well in a different organization, get them through the training as well. Don't think they're sort of too smart for it because they, the odds are really high that they have learned to use other terms and other met metrics where you're not necessarily on the same line. And then do spot checks. So my sort of favorite way of doing it is to just go and talk with people and strike up a conversation and talk a bit about type one error rates. It's like, I'm a really exciting guy to have conversations with. Uh, the other thing is <laughs> I would love to do like graded pop quizzes every like random Monday, but people don't really respond well to that in an office environment. <laughs> the other thing I would say is that you need to have some transparency, and I really recommend having some sort of system in place where you have short explanations for every decision you make with an experiment, put in one or two lines of why you turn it off or turn it on or restarted it, and then share those with all stakeholders and make sure there's no experimentation going on in the dark. And the reason is like you, if you are, if you are here, people might be looking to you as a sort of an expert in the company on A-B testing, but you don't want to be the bottleneck or the guardian of the truth of what a good experiment is. You want the whole organization to self-monitor and sort of keep a check on each other. But I think if you do training and transparency, you get a long way with this. The next thing is reconsider your baseline. And <coughs> I have a short exercise, but I looked at some numbers. A ton gave me some numbers from a workshop we did on Tuesday and on how many experiments the different people in the group here are running. And there's like an order of magnitude difference from people who run no experiments to 10 experiments. There's people who run 100 experiments per month. And there are some people in this audience who run more than 1,000 experiments per month. And I think everyone should sort of sit back and reflect on why is my current rate what it is. And I would recommend when you look at your throughput and your bandwidth on experimentation to sit down and look at it not based on your historical sort of output from your teams, but find other metrics to look at to see what sort of bandwidth you could have. And I have one example here, which is sort of a mock made up screenshot of a mock e-commerce site uh, with made up data. And I would use something like this to sort of look at the performance of my team. Uh, what you see here is sort of typical categories on an e-commerce site. This e-commerce site has five different channels, and then I will look at how many concurrent experiments did we do on our peak day, so on our peak time in uh, peak month. So desktop index page, we once had 20 experiments running concurrently. Totally made up, but an example. And Or you can look at your traffic and say, how many experiments can I run on this, uh, in this particular sp spot at any old time? Then I divide it into segments. How many segments do I really want to target for this particular site? Maybe we would have set down people who are really actively targeting new newcomers and people who really actively target international users. Looking at it like this, I see, okay, I can also do two, sequ two sequential monthly experiments and I get about a baseline of 2,000 experiments. Now, I'm not saying you necessarily want to go out and do 2,000 experiments, but you might do this to sort of like Okay, where am I? This is what I could do. Fill it in with the real numbers and take a look at those teams uh, and see like why do they have this particular throughput on their area if you have different teams working with different parts of this. I also put in a few tricks to drive up your testing velocity. Um, the first one I think is allow overlapping tests and with that I mean experiments where you have participants be in multiple experiments. And I know some of you are using tools where 
you are very like segmented, so participants are in one experiment, while others are using tools like Optimizely, where it's all sort of like people are reused over and over again. And you should, it's a little bit more in, involved to do these overlapping experiments, but you should find a tool that supports that for you. Systematically change variables, like number of articles on the front page, search results, take ideas from top performing sites, uh, experiment with copy images, hire lots of engineers. Do, don't do other things, have people who are dedicated to it, don't like have a engineering team that does a lot of different things, have a lot of people who look at how to do experiments and how to optimize your front page only, uh, or optimize your panel only. At booking.com, when I left, there was 400 people who only worked on optimizing the funnel. And you know, if, depending on what sector you're in, if you want to compete, there are people out there that do things like that. Uh, do display ad experiments, buy some cheap traffic if you want to test something specific. One thing I want to show you is how I would systematically recycle successful hypotheses. And I have this spreadsheet here, again, uh, all made up, but very similar to something I would normally use where I have taken successful experiments, uh, taken out the hypothesis I had, and put it in on the top. And on the side, I have every page, every place I can do an experiment. And then I'm tracking, have I done this particular hypothesis or this particular conversion optimization, optimization, optimization trick in this particular area? And what you see qu pretty quickly then is like, I can run a lot of experiments, but you also see trends of where have I tested this? Uh, where does this work? Which pages do you, uh, can I run uh, a lot of experiments and things like that? There's sort of three things I like with this. Is one, it takes the really compelling, fun, creative uh, thinking of coming up with new experiments a bit out of the process, and instead make it a systematic process of optimizing your funnel. The other thing is when you do experiments, everyone always sort of, you know, they recommend that you have a hypothesis and so on, but it can be a bit of an academic exercise. Well, this actually allows you to um, reuse those hypotheses in a systematic way. And the third thing is it just like explodes the amount of experiment ideas or experiment things you can do in a way that has a high success rate because it will be based off previous successes. The next thing is, and this is sort of how you, one of the strongest tricks in the book when it comes to making a culture, and it is the decision he makes becomes rules. And one example I have is, I used to have this report, very ambitious, solid guy, uh, and we were building a recommender system team together, um, doing sort of vacation recommendations, hotel recommendations, and so on, and he was, we had, it, was, it was going very well, but he started sort of being a little bit fast and dirty with the decision making and started doing this repeat significant testing, which um, Chad talked about earlier. And the, the sort of like, I figured like, well, I don't want to sort of manage this guy at that level. It's a guy I trust a lot, so I'm just gonna let this run. And he, this went well for a while, but after three months, sort of the shit hit the fan on that. And People started sort of doing this across the organization because he had, we had sort of a good reputation. Um, people who knew this was a bad idea noticed, started talking about it, and also the worst part is our experiment success rate started dropping because we were basing it on poor decisions from earlier. Now, three months in, this is a big deal to change it. Like, now I need a sternly worded CTO email and a training, and I, I need to repent and apologize for not catching this earlier and things like that. Well, three months earlier, I could have just had a coffee with my colleague and said, like, one thing that's important for me with this team is have a really strict decision-making process. Speed can be the second sort of most important thing. And by not doing that, I constantly made the decision that this is a rule that we can do this. So. The decisions you make as a leader becomes the rules your organization will follow. The way you can use that to your advantage is, uh, is that you can do this to sort of create positive rules as well. Or one example I have is if everyone has this experiment experience where 
you get these hairy experiment results back. So you pay, maybe you have an uplift in account signups, but at the same time you have a drop in conversion rate. And it might be a head scratcher, it might be worth to take, lose those 50 wins, but then you get those 2,000 account signups and it's like, oh, it's kind of tempting. The way to think about it is sort of, for a small, uh, large organization, a single experiment result does not make a huge difference, but the aggregate makes a big difference. So the decision I make around this experiment, how will that affect my bottom line and the business if the 100 people on my team makes this decision a thousand times? And then a lot of decisions become easier to make because then you have, you have that context. The fourth thing is teach people how to convert. And I'm pretty sure I'm preaching to the choir if I say that conversion optimization is not that easy, and it's a skill that you learn. It's not something you can just do. And I had this experience at Booking.com where that really annoyed me until I realized I did the same thing myself. And it is about three months in after we hired people, they would start doing all these AA tests in our experiment tool. And I would be like, why are you doing this? We have been there for a decade. Don't you think we tested our tool before now? And then the other thing is, if you have 100 people doing AA tests, like Chad talked about earlier, five of those are going to get success significant, successful results, and they'll, they'll prove to themselves that the tool isn't working, which means I would have to go and explain false positives and so on and so on. And what I realized is that the sort of process of going from making cool things and seeing how it affects the metrics to looking at the metrics and then figuring out how you move that metric. It's not a trivial process. And people sort of need to go through this change of mind or mindset change. And that process usually took some kicking off the wheels of the tool before they were willing to accept that maybe they were doing things wrong and I need to learn how to do this. But when they are ready, if you want to be there and teach people how to convert, um, and it's a good way to avoid that people sort of zone out, that they think experimentation is stupid because they can't do the metrics and things like that. So I have, again, a bit of a laundry list of things I found work when it comes to teaching people how to move the needle on conversion rate and other things you want to, want to move. The Kialdini methods of persuasion is like the foundation. Uh, BJ Fogg, BMAT behavior model is a really productive method. Hire trainers and consultants, send people here, share online uh, resources internally. Don't be afraid of, copy, of copying ideas. Uh, fake it till you make it. Do user research sessions, but I guess maybe you should be a bit careful with usertesting.com and the students. Uh, and then give people time to learn, to get through this process. Like, it's, it's, it's not necessarily that easy, particularly if you've been in an organization for a while where people are used to working a different way. So uh, my last point is everything must be tested. And I was going through my slides with Michael before this, and he was like, that's a little bit extreme, don't you think, Matt? Like, everything? Come on, people don't have that much traffic at this conference. Uh, so I was like, hmm. I was actually originally planning to make this my first slide. So I decided, no, I'm going to stick to my guns, but as a compromise, I'll place it as my last slide. <laughs> And what I mean is literally everything. Like you need to fix, you need to test the bug fixes. You need to test strategic initiatives. You need to test those legal requirements, like cookie messages in the EU, known wins. People tell me they exist. Uh, I'm not so sure. Known losses, and also those things where people have spent like 10 years on building it. Um, I had this experience at OpenTable when I first started there, where I really had this sort of task of creating an experiment culture, and I really wanted everything to be tested. And the mobile team had spent half a year building this new review feature for the mobile website, which uh, probably was the first time we launched mobile reviews at all. And they were like, well, you know, you should have validated this before we started this project. I know you, were, you weren't here, so maybe next time we will do this, and so on. The thing is, that's the sunk cost fallacy. And even if you spend six months building something, if it takes down my conversion rate by 2%, it really does not matter. I'd just rather take that loss. But the reason everything should be tested is three. All experiments, an experiment is always a test of an implementation. So I think very much the difference between scientific experiments, where you in the lab try to 
do a really clear test of a scientific hypothesis. What we do with A-B tests is, a very, is typically very hairy implementations where we have made design choices, copy choices, placement choices, and things like that. And those things can always break, and they can always break in IE8. So even that six-month experiment or 10-month experiment, get it out there, test it to make sure everything is working. The other thing is common sense doesn't scale. There are some things that you really kind of don't need to test, like bug fixes. But if you make 500 people make the decision of what is a bug fix and what is a new feature, you're going to have a lot of different decisions and different ideas about what that is. And people in a large organization is usually under a lot of pressure from different sides. So if you allow that to happen, you don't really know what's going to happen in reality. So a great thinker on A-B testing, Ronald Reagan, said, trust but verify. And having an experiment gives you that verification paper trail. And the other last thing is it's always better to know. So even with those legal requirements like a cookie message, if it takes down your conversion rate for 10%, you might have still a, some sort of implementation detail you can fix around this. And it's worth spending time on figuring it out. So yeah, I have five hard learned lessons. This is not everything you need to know to make $100 billion, that's for sure. But it, uh, some things I learned along the road, don't assume people get it. Reconsider your baseline. Decisions becomes rules. Teach people how to convert. And then finally, everything must be tested. And here's the slide of references that I promised. All right, thank you. Thank you, Max. That was 